talented artist working in mainly the music industry. And she is going to share some of her experiences and uh, some of her works with you. So please welcome Kirsten. Oh, and there's a water station outside now. Stay hydrated. It's very important. Uh, hi, everybody. It's the first time I've done one of these standing in front of people since before the, the <laughs> pandemic. So this is a totally different experience seeing faces back. It's nice. Uh, I'm Kristen Hovland. I have been doing this job, which is, you know, we, we suffer from a lexicon problem, I think, as Zach was talking about. Is it uh, projection design? Is it media design? Is it content creation? Is it, uh, I'm going with right now post-disciplinary art, as I'm calling my, <laughs> so I'm calling myself and my company a uh, post-disciplinary artist, post-disciplinary studio. We are more interested in than in any one term or any one medium kind of calling ourselves. Um, again, we, we, we don't, as an industry, we're still kind of working, and, and now that the metaverse, metaverse, all that stuff is coming in, we're going to run into a whole other lexicon problem. So defining yourself is uh, <laughs> super interesting. Um, so I will just show you some pretty pictures to start with. Hello. Um, this was for the 1975 Music for Cars tour, which is a huge vertical screen with a little pop out in the back that uh, the lead singer would go stand in. Um, and this is some of our other work. This is uh, Beck's Midnight Running Tour. And I've started with these because all of, not that first one, the first one was I just liked. But this one <laughs> involved very on a very, pretty profound creative change um, that we were brought in to uh, accommodate. Um, Beck, you can see the screen design here done, screen and lights and set done by the super talented Stephen Mills. Uh, a big upstage wall, they were gonna do, you know, a couple of videos from us, some content, and then, you know, just a lot of IMAG of Beck and the band. And they had great cameras and a good camera director. And then Beck, had, he went to see Team Lab in Tokyo, in Tokyo and was like, I want to be in a mirror box, you guys. <laughs> Let's build a mirror box and tour it. And everyone was like, okay. <laughs> um, drilling down into kind of the, the impulse of the problem, because obviously we can't just put the performer inside a box separated from the audience. And... Uh, you know, he's also sharing that the night running tour was uh, multi-band. So they were sharing trucks with a couple of different bands. There was a lot of logistics involved. Um, so what was the impulse behind why he wanted to make this change? And a lot of that was a discussion with the artist. Drilling down to the heart of it, he wasn't super into this, the really HD clean iMag behind them, with them super huge and just their faces. And he wanted to do something more interesting and, you know, so that you know the iMag on the side, it wasn't just a smaller version of the iMag in the in the middle, which wasn't just a bigger version of his head, mostly. Um, so we got brought in to solve the problem of Beck in a mirror box, um, and some of that was using a notch to run the cameras through and and uh, integrate that. So kind of using the camera as a layer and a mask and and affecting that to fill this kind of world. Um, and the other part of that was uh, building actual mirror boxes, small, and sit inside a for you rack uh, that we put a screen, put the, the arrays of mirrors and a camera that captured the screen, routed that in SDI, in SDI out, back in a mirror box inside of a rack. And, and that, <laughs> And that came from, you know, we had that idea evolved, like as we're trying to figure out how to achieve like the, the core goal of that was, you know, what do we do? Do we, you know, do we, have to do, you know, a box that he comes and puts his head in and we start kind of mocking that up. And the question was like, well, can he wear a hat? And we're like, no, <laughs> he can't wear a hat in the mirror box. Like he's going to want to wear a hat. Um, also, there's a certain liability with putting your, a uh, huge famous rock star building something they're going to put their head into. So we, as we're sitting there kind of wondering what we're going to do, I said, 
what if I just wish we could shrink him down? You know, and my partner has a lot of Lego figurines around and we're, you know, playing with the Lego figurines and some mirrors, just solving the problem. Like if you were this big, this would be easy. <laughs> with video, we can change the scale of things. So we don't have to put him in the mirror box. We can put a video of him in and uh, get that same super analog effect of the mirrors that he was interested in. So uh, up next, Foo Fighters 2021, coming back out of the pandemic. Um, this, the whole, whole creative impulse behind this one was that we really wanted to be present with the band. Like we, we had just been absent from each other for a really long time. And we wanted to make the content mostly about the camera, about the audience, about the band, about that, that co-presence, that energy of being together. So we also did a, a bunch of notch live mixing and effects. Uh, there was nine cameras, I think, on stage, capturing different things like pedal boards and uh, keyboards, and we could, we could blend this together real time, you know, build kind of a video instrument for the programmer to play um, so that we could really capture this, this liveness, this feeling of presence. Um, that's one of the looks. We also uh, expanded upon the mirror box idea. This has two cameras inside of it, uh, looking at a piece of broken mirror that my partner smashed and then meticulously put back together. <laughs> we had to smash a few mirrors before we figured out how to, you know, smash it in a way that we could put it back together. Um, you know, super effective, this really analog sense of the edges and the brokenness. Um, so, there ended up being four physical effects boxes on this tour. Um, this is another one, sort of a multi-mirror. We call this one triptych. It's got three mirror spaces. You can feed it three camera feeds. Um, I think this one has, yeah, Dave in the middle and then, oops, some things in the background. So the, the big change here was we were planning to, they were planning to go back out on tour. Um, and we had, by the time we got everything all signed off on and, we had maybe six weeks to create all the content and these mirror boxes and the, you know, the notch looks. It's, it's not, it's working in music, that's a lot more normal. I know for theater, that's like, holy crap. Um, but for, yeah, six to eight weeks is pretty normal. Then uh, we get a phone call from management saying, hey, so Madison Square Garden, we're gonna open up, we're gonna open up Madison Square Garden in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> can we put something together? And well, the answer of course is yes. <laughs> um, but the, the, you know, that's a huge change in schedule. Like what, what do you, you can't, you can't put a show together that you had only six weeks for in three weeks. So we had to kind of manage, think about what, how we were going to compartmentalize, manage the expectations of what we're going to produce. Like, okay, mirror boxes will not be done for Madison Square Garden, but we can throw in some more notch looks. We had a bit more content. We were able to hire a few more people to kind of speed up some of the processes. So a big time change is also kind of the thought of a creative change. And then in the background, knowing that when they wanted to go out on tour, they were still gonna want the original concept. We had to keep working on that, even though we were throwing a lot of resources into making that three week change happen. Um, this one is Danny Elfman at Coachella. Uh, this is an example of a process that's very hard to change once it gets started. Uh, we pitched and he loved the idea of this stop motion um, piece of a deconstructed suburban landscape um, for just another day. Uh, you can see our talented animator Melody over there uh, assembling just thousands of uh, strips of printed paper. Um, I wish I should have thought to put a video of this one. Maybe if we have time, I'll go find it or link to it. Um, you know, and about, we started this before the pandemic where the original Coachella show was, again, we had six weeks to put this together. So doing stop motion uh, in, in no time flat, plus a few other pieces uh, kind of requires a really organized, focused uh, step to the process, but also building this in a really modular way so that each of these shots could be mixed and blended in a different way in case we needed to make changes. Like, you know, musicians, especially working with musicians, 
um, can be pretty volatile. They can decide they don't like an idea or it's not working for them, even though they spent a lot of money on it uh, or a lot of time on it and there's not a lot of time left. So how do you kind of build in to any creative project the idea that it could change at any moment and you're going to have to make it work somehow? So uh, this, this one, we did again that super labor intensive stop motion, but in a really modular and kind of almost object oriented way. Um, thinking of each, each scene and each kind of piece as, a, as its own element that we could then composite later. So using the digital tools to recreate some flexibility within the super uh, time intensive hand, hand generated tools. I'll get one more, maybe two more. Um, this is at LACMA. We had the, at the art and film gala. We've been working with them for seven or so years. Um, and this is projection mapping of kind of a Betty Saar inspired piece. Uh, this is the last time anybody ever got to projection map on this building because this building is now gone. They tore it down for the new one. Uh, so it's a little bit bittersweet. Uh, and we kind of built this piece as sort of a love letter to, you know, what was and hope for what was coming. Um, that's sort of the, the farewell look. And then the change there is that the Gucci sponsors that um, event and they're like, hey, that content you did for, for uh, LACMA, what if we mapped that onto a Richard Meyer building? And so, <laughs> so not just a, I mean, the creative direction remained the same, but the, the canvas changed pretty drastically. Um, so having to kind of, and, and also not wanting to do the exact same thing, like that was one moment, this is kind of another moment. So can this piece get pulled back apart and put back together in a way that kind of honors the original intent, makes it sort of a new, but also fits this new canvas. But again, with not a lot of time and not as much budget as we would like, of course. Um, last one, Tears for Fears 2022, the most recent. Uh, in original creative direction, we had proposed a lot of, uh, you know, you've seen the, if you're familiar with the Tears for Fears kind of album artwork, there's a lot of collage, there's a lot of sunflowers, like sunflowers, super iconic flowers, all that. We proposed a, uh, a collage, I brought my mother in, <laughs> actually this was super personal for me, who's also a collage artist. And uh, we, you know, we worked on this really beautiful uh, sunflower inspired collage. And then, you know, about two weeks out, they're like, yeah, I wonder if we're feeling more. And this wasn't from the band, this is from management. We didn't actually end up talking to the band directly. These are kind of some of the problems you can run as like this more kind of cosmic feeling. Like, you know, we were kind of looking for being a little bit more, you know, less, less literal, more celestial. So this is one of the things we, we came up with and we went through rehearsal and uh, showed them everything. And they're like, oh, that's really great. But what about the sunflowers? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because that piece had been really personal to me, I decided to continue on with it. I'm like, there's no way they're not going to want the sunflowers. So my designer, Butch Allen, looks at me after they're gone. He's like, you brought it, right? <laughs> I'm like, I brought it. <laughs> it's here. So. Those are some of the kind of change war stories that uh, have arisen. And they're in some ways beautiful, in some ways traumatic. Change in creative direction, especially depending on when in the process, can be really devastating. Um, especially if it's something you've put a lot of time and energy and love into, or time is short, budget is gone, and people want changes, what do you do? Uh, so here's sort of my, my map of an ideal world of how a content conversation that somebody else is paying for goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit different. Um, you know, when you're, especially a lot of your students, you're coming, you know, you're working collaboratively. You know, there, there are other stakeholders. You've got teachers who are giving notes. Um, you're doing a lot of these things for yourself and for your learning process. As soon as somebody else is paying you to do something, they start to, they have a really large say in how it's going to go. Um, so navigating that landscape is really important and, uh, and also tricky and requires, I think, a lot of experience and 
diplomacy and maturity. All the things you will develop and a lot of what I'm going to say kind of here are things I wish somebody had told me and I'm sure you're still going to have to learn some of them for yourself. But uh, yeah, in, in an ideal world, you'll meet, say it's working for a band, you'll meet your, your band. They're great. They're lovely people. Most often you'll have this wonderful dialogue about your feelings, about philosophy, about design, about what they're looking at and what they're loving. You'll present a mood board and style frame that say, is it like this? And they'll say, yes, maybe not that one, that one, okay. Uh, you'll get a screen and server spec. It will resemble reality in some way, shape or form. Uh, and then you'll propose a direction. You'll produce the content. There'll be a few tweaks. You'll go on with the show. It does happen like that sometimes. <laughs> But no plan, however meticulously drafted, survive, con survives contact with reality. <laughs> and even in the, in the smallest ways, sometimes the, the, the tiniest oversight can, be, can magnify. And in sometimes that, that tiny oversight was huge and no one should have made it. Uh, all right. So how do you respond gracefully uh, to creative changes, especially when they come from the, you know, your, your boss, your client, your client is a lead singer, a guitar player, a 16 year old pop star, you know, who's, who's footing the bill for this and also has really strong opinions, but didn't have them until they actually looked at the piece, which was a week ago. And you've been working on it for four weeks. <laughs> um, that has happened to us. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? It requires that your methodology accounts for total disaster from the very beginning. You, <laughs> you, you have to consider as you're starting out that things might go wrong and there, your best case scenario is, oops, not necessarily a pipe dream, but um, you hope for it to go that way, but as, as Zach or anyone can tell you, as soon as you get other people in the room who have, you know, opinions, you're the lighting designer, you've got the, you know, the sound shows up and suddenly there are, you know, four big towers of speakers in between where your projectors are going to be and your screen. Uh, how, how do you accommodate for the fact that these things are going to change and you can't, you can't stop them. You can't, in a lot of cases, say, no, I'm not going to do this. I guess you could, but that would mean you quit or get fired. Um, so that means understanding your workflow at the very beginning and designing it uh, to be extensible and responsive and flexible. Um, and these are, I, I can't give you exact methodology for that because every artist's workflow and every studio's workflow is really different. Um, we tend to use really physical under camera things filtered back through digital pieces like Notch or After Effects that give us some flexibility there. But if you're working in a 3D environment or you know, however you're working, you'll have to kind of find the pieces that work for you. But there are some, and I'm borrowing a little bit as I was coming through this, I realized this starts to sound a bit like Sun Tzu. So I'm kind of <laughs> using the art of war as a, uh, <laughs> um, as chapter headings here, but you have sort of your initial calculations, right? Your, the thing you have control over in all of these situations is your workflow. Um, and as you're putting together a pitch, uh, a budget, you're looking at uh, how complex is the, the creative? Does this, is this the right fit for my studio? Like if somebody comes to electronic countermeasures and said, hey, we really love those photorealistic forests and avatar, could you make us those? We'll be like, probably not. We'll send you to a studio who can, <laughs> because that's not a workflow that we can really accommodate quickly um, or I think well. But when, when something kind of falls into your, your sweet spot, like how, how much time are you going to need? How many artists, like what kind of is, you know, how, the time to deadline is the next thing. Like, do you have six weeks? Do you have three weeks? Do you have eight weeks, eight months? If you're at a big theater program, like how, how long do you have to make decisions and respond to changes and how collaborative will the process be? Will you be alone in your studio until you get on site three days before the first show where you do a lot of learning in three days and stay up for a couple, you know, for all of them? Uh, 
the physical <laughs> the physical screen layout and, and raster how many pixels are you dealing with if you know you can you can respond a lot pa faster at 720p than you can at 10k um, that's just that's just the reality so you know if, if you need large render time you're going to have to back time a lot of your uh, a lot of your processes and consider that changes are going to be a lot more fraught. Um, also, you know, considering your media server and your, your programming capabilities. Um, a lot of the, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. There's all of them have different strengths and skills. Different programmers work a different way. Knowing who you're delivering content to, uh, if, especially if you're able to, if you had a relationship with them before and you know this person, you know what they expect and you know what they can handle. There's certain programmers where if you know, a massive change comes through, I know I can hand them a pile of nonsense and they can make art, like they can be trusted to, um, you know, to kind of put it together if, if that needs to happen. Or you know, say I've got a 10K raster and I'm using disguise uh, and the client wants one minute out of a 10 minute piece changed. I can just render that one minute. I don't need to re-render the full 10 minutes. I can, I can do frame replacement. So knowing kind of where your, not cheats are, but where, where your kind of get out of jail free cards are with the media server. Like, can you hue shift in a, in a reasonable way? Or, or do you have to take things back to be re-rendered because the hue shift is ugly? Like kind of knowing and building for that. If, if you know your client doesn't understand color very well and will want to look at a lot of it on, on site and on the screen and with lighting, building content that can gracefully hue shift you know, starting in black and white, building in different layers um, will give you a lot more flexibility. Uh, budget, of course, part of the initial calculation. Um, how, how much of your budget can you reserve for changes and disaster? Uh, if you need to hire four more animators at the, you know, 11th hour to finish something, do you have to go back to the client for money if, if that happens? Or is, have you considered that already because you know your client or your creative process is more volatile. Um, and again, these are all, all discussions that, that is different for every project. Um, you know, for especially the big pop stars, for, for in our experience, larger budget projects tend to, I don't have to go back to them for money all that often. They're like, we, we build in the contingency, we, you know, that's kind of understood. And when those changes come up, we can just respond to them. Smaller budget projects, uh, when changes come up, sometimes require a renegotiation um, about like, well, actually, we don't want a forest, we want a cityscape. Okay, <laughs> we'll make one of those, but uh, it's going to take three days and uh, another 10 grand. Let's just throw numbers around. Um, is, that, is that a change you actually want to make? Um, your available resources? Uh, that's your render power. Is it just you alone with a laptop in a in an arena, or do you have you know a mobile render farm and twelve animators that you've brought on site, or do you have a studio back in you know Sydney or somewhere that you can send changes back to that they can respond to? Uh, if you're working in different time zones, this will come up. Like when are your people awake, um, and like how fast can changes be turned around? Um, and yeah, can you can you scale up? And I, some wisdom from uh, from Butch Allen was that you can you know you can always spend more money, um, but wait, <laughs> there's you can buy almost anything except time. There's one thing like no matter at a certain point, no matter how much money your client has, how much money you're authorized to spend, you cannot get more days. The show is happening. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the volatility of your client and your the power dynamic between who you're working with. Are, are you working directly with an artist? Are you working with their management and hoping that they're translating the artist's uh, needs to you? Are you working for a designer that's working for an artist? How, like, how are you communicating effectively and how do you know that you're communicating effectively? Uh, and, you know, is this like, Let's say Beyonce, who you, you just know the process is if Beyonce wants something changed, something's going to get changed. You don't there. I mean, the power dynamic is you have none. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Or, you know, is, is it a more collaborative process where you're in a theater and the lighting designer says, hey, this is going to, I hate that green. And you're like, this green is very important to the storytelling. Um, you know, is there some discussion you can have? Uh, and also, yeah, the, the size of assets and your delivery needs. This one gets overlooked a little bit, but uh, how are you getting the files to where they're going? Um, you know, if you're in, you're here and your project is in London, uh, is your internet robust enough to send a 10K raster with a couple of days turnaround? Do you need to send drives? By the way, especially post pandemic, uh, it's very expensive to guarantee delivery anywhere. I got quoted uh, for Tears for Fears, I think I got quoted $10,000 to guarantee a drive delivery to uh, England over a holiday. And I was like, uh, they're gonna find internet, thanks. <laughs> they can rent a you know telco hotel rack for a couple of months for cheaper than that at this point. So um, yeah, having having the plan because all of this will determine how a change, how how quickly you can respond to an impacted change. Like if you've got one gig, ten gig internet up and down, you know you can you can be passing files back and forth. Um, and is there a way to kind of circumvent that problem? Like when we were doing uh, Tears for Fears, we were on hotel internet, which was slightly better than the venue internet because we were in a shed in Ohio. Um, and I had an animator back home who was making changes um, and we couldn't, we couldn't move the notch LC assets fast enough. So luckily, uh, we had a mirror of each other's projects. We planned this before. We kind of thought this was going to be a problem knowing that we were coming into a shed. So instead of moving assets, we were transferring small projects and the small art assets. And then she would make changes and I would hit render on my machine and then I just had the files. So uh, is there things you can add to your workflow that will kind of negate some of those bottlenecks? Uh, yeah. Other things to consider when your weaknesses and strengths. Um, how fragile is your software and plugins? You know, if you're if you're using After Effects and you know, you, if, especially if you've all been there with like Star Glow or some of those other ones that clients, especially corporate, love, uh, but that render really poorly, um, and and somewhat, yeah, well, definitely fragilely. Um, how how can you, especially on a big canvas, deal with a plugin like that, that, um, you know, will sometimes pop out frames for no particular reason or change intensity. Uh, and there's all sorts of, um, so considering that in your workflow, uh, what's the review schedule like? Uh, how often does your client want to see things? How often do you get to show work? Sometimes it's not very often. And then you're, your turnaround time for changes gets a little harder. Um, also, are there any internal processes that you can tailor to change? So do you have, again, I'm gonna use After Effects, you know, an After Effects project that has a bunch of your common or favorite things that you do that you can always have with you and pull up, um, or, you know, a notch block or something that, some kind of, not get out of jail free card exactly, but something that, that is a familiar starting point to you when something changes and you're starting from scratch and you have just a bunch of resources that are always available to you that you know how they work. Your favorite Swiss Army knife, exactly. Yep. <laughs> uh, the other thing to consider as both a weakness and a strength is human frailty. We need to eat, we need to sleep, we break, we get sick. Um, it, it's especially uh, been a problem during the pandemic. If somebody tests positive for COVID, half your crew is gone. Um, <laughs> you know, like uh, if somebody gets in, you know, has a, a family emergency or gets, God forbid, into an accident, like how, how are you going to respond to the fact that humans have responsibilities and needs outside of the job? And considering that is, uh, is important. How are you going to replace somebody if they're not replaceable? Um, what are you going to do in their absence? So a lot of this is this prep work that's going on in your head, either as you're building a practice, really, um, and, and as you're going through each, each pitch, each budget, these are kind of the things that are, should be always kind of in, in the background, like 
well, I've got this animator, but I know he's taking care of his dad right now. So maybe uh, I'll rely, uh, I'll rely on him, but know that I might have to step in myself if something happens or you're having some backup plans. Uh, also, uh, ergonomics and creature comforts. I remember I saw your, your guy sitting there on a cinder block. That happens too, but as we get older, especially for the younger students, your body will start to give up on you. If you're sitting on a cinder block or a road case, uh, you'll end up with a weird back or repetitive stress injury. Um, I walked around in a sling for a while and was like, what happened to you? And I'm like, I used my mouse wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not kidding, had to switch to a tablet for a while. Um, it, considering your body as part of your practice and as part, as part of your tools, you have to take care of it. Um, you know, if something feels bad for an hour, how's it going to feel in 10 hours? How's it going to feel in 100 hours? Um, so requesting a good chair and a good table on, uh, on projects. You, You'd be surprised how often nobody thinks they hire a crew of animators and like, well, where are we going to sit? Anybody think to bring tables? <laughs> we got a bunch of laptops. Um, so you know, we, we end up putting that in our contract, in our budget. Like, this is something you have to provide or we cannot provide the work. Now, it's not saying we won't, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's said it's going to be a problem. And, um, you know, if I don't have a proper chair and table and I have to like sit on a box like this, I'm going to get less done. Uh, I'm going to be slower. And, and then, yeah, I already talked about the delivery. Um, there was a helicopter once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a cruise ship job and uh, cruise ships, you know, sail around and don't necessarily, this was many years ago, internet and all that stuff has gotten better, mobily speaking, but, uh, we had a massive change to the entire creative direction of a show uh, midway after the cruise ship had already sailed. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we were able to get some of it to them while they were in port in the, in the Bahamas, I think. But again, it was 10, uh, eight years ago in the Bahamas, the internet wasn't great. So the next thing we had to do was call Rocket Cargo and say, I have a hard drive. <laughs> have two hard drives, one, one main and one backup, if you're going to do this. Uh, and they uh, put it on a helicopter and brought it to a harbor master who then met the ship <laughs> in a little like Zodiac dinghy <laughs> off port somewhere in the middle of the Bahamas. And apparently that worked because I didn't hear from them again for a little while while they were sailing around and at sea trials. Yeah, so if you're using, a, if you're on a cruise ship, how often is your ship in port? Um, you know, every, like I said, every project is going to have its unique set of circumstances and definitely cases of like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I can't, okay. Like, and it, at this point in my career, it's, it's hard to surprise me. Um, it's, I suppose that might sound like a challenge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Variations and adaptability. So th things to think about in your own workflow. Um, flexibility, Zach talked about being water, and that's a metaphor I kind of use, although it, it feels a little less poetic. When I end up in one of these change situations, I feel like I am a river flowing over some rapids and I'm bouncing off rocks and spinning around. And, uh, Think of that process as you're, you intentionally went whitewater rafting, not that you fell off a cliff into a river. <laughs> like, this is the fun part. So, like, here, here's where it, attitude is kind of everything. Um, the sense of humor. How, how fluid can you be in your thinking? How, um, and, you know, especially if you're working in partnerships with people, sometimes one partner is better at this than the other. Some people like their structure. It's good to have somebody who's more of a chaos muppet. And, uh, and good at dealing with the, uh, the chaos and the, just the slings and arrows of outrageous misfortune that is sometimes uh, any production. Um, headroom, when you're building a budget and a schedule, have you scheduled yourself and budgeted yourself right up to the wire? Um, or do you have, like I said, some, some budget, some time to deal with major changes or minor changes? Uh, can you build that headroom in 
and communicating that to your client too. Like you, I can do it for this money in this time. There's no headroom. If we don't get together on this, you know, right away, we're, we're going to have trouble making changes. So a lot of it is a dialogue um, and communicating very clearly what the expectations are. Uh, time to complete is, is the tour going out and you can't ever see it again, or can you follow it on a few dates? Um, to, to make a few changes, like are, are there, is there some wiggle room and time to complete or are you going, going out to broadcast and that's the show it is. So you, you don't have any flexibility at a certain time, you can't change because you're live. And if you put something new into the media server, everyone will scream at you. <laughs> or sometimes the screens producer will just say no. And then the content creator will uh, go lean up against a wall and slump down and then fall asleep because I've seen that happen too. Um, <laughs> like the doors are already open, my friend, you can put nothing else in the media server. If it, if it breaks, it's on all of us. Um, so some of the ways, I, I come from a programming background. I started in computer engineering before wandering off into uh, animation and virtual reality. I was a little early for virtual reality. Uh, so decided to come here into concerts so, but I have, I have a basis in, in thinking about code, like animation is code, functions, um, how do I even say, like, is, is there one thing I do over and over again? Can I make that its own extensible piece and then use that over and over again? Is there something that I can bolt onto that that becomes its own part? Uh, can I, can I build something so that if the client says, okay, we're doing this piece on diamonds, we got diamonds everywhere. And so I've built, I've built all this stuff and I've got this diamond asset here and all this stuff is happening. And the client says, hey, turtles, it should be turtles. It's just like diamond, turtle. And now it's turtles doing the thing. Is it possible to build your projects in such a way that like pretty fundamentally, fundamental changes can be done with a couple of button clicks? Um, and extensibility, how, how can you take something that you've made and make it more? And then also, can you take all of that stuff back down to one thing and change? So it's, it's sort of managing your dependencies in your projects. If you wanna change a light in a 3D world, like does that, do you have to rebake the lighting or is it dynamic? Uh, how, how much flexibility do you have? Uh, reusability, also an important part in programming and I think animation. Um, how, how reusable are your assets? Is there something you can change to, use, to fit a whole nother, uh, whole nother use case? Um, is there an animation process that with a few changes in parameters can become something else, uh, keeping those around? Also very important to keep a good archive. I'll get into that a little bit later. And also to save versions, uh, especially after big changes, but also somewhat after after modest changes, there's there's been times where I look back and like I went down a bad path, and the path started here, uh, so I could backtrack to a version as opposed to having to undo work. And it's also happened where I make a change for a client and I stay up for a couple of days, and it's uh it's I really like the new direction, and I've gotten kind of attached to it, and they're like, you know, I liked it better before. Bring out the old version. Start from, start from there. Um, and yeah, do you have spare cycles anywhere in your process to like uh, always be rendering? You know, is there is there things you can kind of pre-render, render out, so that you have uh, like high high time render processes? Um, you're not trying to chunk it all out at the end. You can kind of build layers. And then and then from there, you've already got modularity built in. Like this layer is already rendered. This layer is already rendered. This layer is rendered. Combine them together into the final asset. Or these two are good. This one needs to change. I can just pull that out without having to then re like spend all of the cycles re-rendering that stuff. Uh, I want to point out too that our studio is a studio of two principals. There's only two of us. Um, most most days we have some freelancers that we bring in but we do a lot of these really big concerts on a on a person and um, equipment budget of, of two um, we've invested in kind of that same idea of modularity and reusability like all of our computers uh, become 
a render network. So every, even this laptop, if I needed to, uh, to add some more computer cycles, could get plugged into our, our render queue. Every computer we've ever owned until it dies will at least try to chunk out a few frames for bigger jobs. <laughs> like you just you wake it up, turn it on, <laughs> make sure it's got all the plugins it needs, sometimes buy more versions of After Effects from Adobe, all that stuff. Um, is yeah, how, every resource, like, how can you use every resource at your disposal to make your life easier? And if you're thinking about that on the projects that go well, uh, and building in that headroom when things start to go a little wrong, um, that's when that's when that really pays dividends. Uh, transferability, uh, organization. How is your how is your world and project uh, organized? If you hand somebody else a project, uh, can they open it and make changes to it, or are you me and <laughs> it's really um, uh, esoteric and internal to your own head, like? There are, I'm not saying one way is better. There, there are sometimes moments when I'm coming up with something new and interesting that I just have to, I just have to make a mess. Um, but then I can't expect to hand that mess to one of my animators and expect them to be able to use it. I own that mess for the rest of the project. Um, so if I expect to hand something to my partner or to a freelancer or to anybody else, I have to think about how can I communicate what's going on here. Um, I did once unexpectedly have to hand the project to Carl Glob, uh, and he said, no, oh, no, it was fine. I, you know, I made myself a tea. <laughs> I took, it took a whole day and, uh, and this, this was not a project I had, we had ever intended to share. It was sort of an emergency. And he's like, you know, and I just went through it and I tell you what, I learn something new every time I do that. <laughs> like, wow, that's a clever way. I would not have thought of that. <laughs> Sorry, I, but I still try never to give, you know, messy projects to, to somebody else. And then, yeah, onboarding. If you bring somebody on or bring a new computer into your ecosystem, how fast can you do that? Do you have a process for doing that? Um, I've got a, a pretty fantastic war story. <laughs> um, American Music Awards, Nick Jonas, uh, a couple of, couple of years back now. Nick Jonas hasn't, I don't know if he's been touring for a while. So it was a while ago, um, but uh, they changed the track uh, the night before, pretty significantly. He had uh, he had a big drum solo in the middle, and well, they decided that wasn't a great idea um, for whatever reason. They changed the track a lot, <laughs> and it was it was yeah, it was the night before, two nights two nights before day day of and. You know, we were kind of new in our operation. We were starting to think, you know, about all of this stuff, this modularity. We'd, we'd kind of put some of this stuff in place. Um, and we did some calculations on our render to redo everything. And this was also at 60 frames a second because that's what that video director wanted to do at that time. So it's double the problem and it's a, you know, 10 minute medley. Also a bit of a problem. We did the calculations on the things we'd have to change and we realized we were going to fall about four hours short on the render of being able to deliver before um, rehearsal. And the only thing we could do there is add more computers. <laughs> and luckily we had built some headroom into the budget and, and sort of into our operational budget as a whole. And I'm sitting there at the studio with my partner and he's like, I'm like, how many, how many computers do we need? He's like, about two, like two. So I got in the car, I drove up to Pasadena to the Apple store uh, he, while I was on the way, he called me and said they have two Mac Pros of this spec in, in their, in their back. Um, it was about 8 PM. So they were going to close in about an hour. So I'm driving, I valet my car at the restaurant next door. I don't know, Pasadena is that old town. It was like a Friday night and it was hopping. Um, I valet my car, uh, go into the store, kind of throw down the credit card and say those two. Now, please. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, you know, they look at me and I'm like, no, I am serious. You have two in the back, please. I need them. And they brought them out real quick. We dispensed with all of the, the spiel back and forth about monitors and things. I, they could tell I wasn't into it. I uh, grabbed my two Mac Pros, walked back out, and lost my valet ticket. Oh, no. <laughs> so somewhere between the store next door, just gone. So anyway, I think the valet guy thought I had just stolen two Mac Pros and a car. <laughs> but I looked... 
scared enough that he wasn't going to mess with it. They figured the police would sort it out later. But anyway, took my Mac Pros, <laughs> drove back. Um, we, we stood them up in about an hour, uh, put them into the render queue, chunked the frames through. I slept on the studio couch that night and, uh, and we uh, wrapped everything and brought it into, uh, into the American Music Awards the theaters. I think it was the Microsoft Theater at the time or Nokia. I remember exactly, and this. nobody was any the wiser that we just had a whole bunch of drama. <laughs> They're like, oh, were you able to change for, change, make the change for the track? Like, yes. Yep, no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of lessons. Um, lack of starry-eyed optimism does not necessarily equal pessimism. I approach everything with a, a healthy bit of skepticism. Uh, I tend to I tend to be a pretty cheerful optimist. I think everything's going to go great. Um, I also, at the same time, think that everything's going to just go terribly wrong, and I have to be prepared. Uh, a sense of humor, no matter how dark and bleak, goes a long way. Um, you know, I I tell these stories, and realize in the at the time that they are inherently pretty funny. Like this whole situation is going to be really funny to me later when it, when it works out. So I try to carry that sense of humor into the moment so that I, I keep my energy up. Um, creating a uh, collaborative dialogue with your client and avoiding an adversarial one is really important. You know, you, you can get into a feeling of like, you are doing this to me and my team. Um, and you don't understand how this hurts us. Like Zach also mentioned like, oh, it's so easy to press a few buttons and make a change. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes depending on the change, it's, it's emotionally, it's in, um, technically emotionally everything devastating. Um, so how do you approach those conversations? Uh, say yes, yes and, <laughs> like, yes, I want to do this for you. I want to make you happy. How, how do we work together to make that happen? As opposed to, well, you said this, and uh, here's the reason why this isn't gonna work. And, you know, immediately, that creates a conflict. It becomes an us versus them, of you know, my needs versus this person who's not meeting my needs. Um, yeah, uh, trust but verify. Assume good faith, but uh, but get the receipts. Uh, so, especially starting out, you're going to do a lot of projects on somewhat shoestring budget and on a handshake contract. Um, in a lot of cases, that will get you into trouble when these big changes happen, because there's no roadmap for how, who's going to pay for it, how it's going to happen, what it's gonna to do to you. Um, in, a, in a lot of our, when we get a contract, we'll say like a change that impacts 30% of the, the work immediately requires a change order. Um, you know, that's not appropriate for every project, um, but having something in writing, even an email that you can point back to and say, here's where you agreed to it here's where I agreed to it. <laughs> or sometimes, you know, for yourself and you're like, I did agree to that. Um, yep, cool. Uh, you, you want to have something that at least protects what you were trying to do, why you did it. Um, because it can get into these sort of ugly, ugly situations where you're out of, it's usually around money, you're out of money and out of time. And you can't, you will, your studio will start to go into the hole on this project if you keep making these changes for this client. How do you both keep them happy and make sure you can pay your, all your people and, you know, pay yourself and put dinner on the table? Uh, so being careful about what's agreed to, having documentation, even if, if it's a phone call, uh, send an email back that said, here's what we talked about on the phone. You know, confirm for me that this is correct and then we'll get started. So if it's not a whole formal like lawyer review process about what this guy, at least you've got something to point back to. So you can have that collaborative dialogue from a position of, of strength. Uh, at, at the end, we're all on the same side, um, especially when working in music. You want the audience to have a great time. You want the artist to feel good in front of the work. Um, you know, you, we, all, we all are working towards the same amazing show. Um, but chaos arises, things happen. Uh, so keeping focused on what the problem is and working the problem, it's a, I guess, aviation term, like you, your plane is crashing, work the problem. But how are you, how are you going to fix it? You, you focus on what you can do, um, what you can affect. 
and you know go from you have kind of steps go from go from can we get the flaps working okay do we have a you know do we have a parachute <laughs> at the end like how how far down is this going to go um okay um kind of impact of changes i went over that diplomacy is is your friend again that collaborative dialogue first things first when you get hit with something especially something that hurts take a beat to think um i have have had a few tragic cases where i loved a piece or the piece was agreed to by everybody and we made it and we spent a lot of money on it and like we had wonderful stop motion animators doing this whole thing in like record time and everyone put their heart and soul into it and the artist was like well nah. oh, no Oh no, mate. That's not quite what I had had in mind. I just, I just think I, I think we want the CG violins back. And uh, the CG violins are 320p, and this is a 4K show. And now we've got this whole thing. Uh, in that moment, I went back to my car and had a had a good cry. <laughs> like, okay, uh, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna go make a few phone calls and see what we can do. And and you know, remove myself from the situation for a little bit. However, that works. Take a beat to get your emotions under control and and not just emotions like take a beat really to think about what this is going to really do like you have to stop and think how am i how am i going to accommodate this change can i accommodate this change you don't want to say yes or no or anything until you've had a chance to really assess so take that moment you don't have to respond right away you can say i need to i need to check i need to ask a few questions so then ask those questions ask of your team ask the questions of whoever is making the change like what exactly is driving this what do you want how do we accomplish this like is there a way to accomplish this that isn't a total uh, barn fire of my uh my entire last four weeks work you know is is there what, what's actually driving this this change like in the case of uh beck wanting to be in a mirror box really what he was asking was i just don't like the clean giant hdi mag like, so getting into kind of the psychology, like who can you ask those questions of? Can you say, okay, at this point, I need to talk to the artist. Like, you may not, you know, it's Paul McCartney, you may, you may not be able to, uh, but you can ask, like see if you can get it exactly from who's, who's telling you that these changes are, are coming and then really ask them what they want. Uh, assess the impact, what is it going to do to you? And then communicate that impact. Uh, like this will, uh, take four more days, cost twenty thousand more dollars, and if that's something you're not okay with, how do we meet in the middle? Or is it really what you want? Um, proposed solutions, like if you think of something in the moment, or you know, after taking your beat, and it's like, you know, what if what if this would work? Propose it. You know, it you're you're not in a position of strength necessarily, but you're not in a position of weakness. You are the creator of a very important part of the show. If you've got an idea that could maybe accomplish the goal, propose it and see what they say. So, uh, and then ask for what you need. If you need more animators, you need more time, you need more, uh, yeah. And then also there are situations and they're probably pretty rare in, in corporate and in, when people are there paying, but can you say no? Can you say this, you know, especially if you're on a broadcast show they're like, we want to do this this change and we'll be able to get it in five minutes before before air. And you'll be like, no, <laughs> you cannot have that. And and there are ways, depending on the project, to put put stop gaps in place. Um, you know, in the case of like the screens producer is like, my screens producer won't let me do that. <laughs> the producers say we can't change, you know, we can't change anything with the server after they've seen it. You know, there's there's reasons to to do these things. Uh, and then set realistic expectations. Uh, definitely clearly define what the new new success looks like, and uh, set expectations with hope to exceed them. So you know the old saying, uh, "Under promise, over deliver." Um, if you can try try and give yourself try and build that headroom back in, so that if you have time to to really exceed what you want to do, then you can do it. And then always explore contingencies. There might be other ways to do what you want or what they want. Um, there's, and sometimes they involve like, is this really a video problem? Is this, or like, should we turn the video off here? Like, 
should we should we make this more of a lighting song? Should we go to a color? You know, are are there other creative uses that might be suiting the needs of the project better? Uh, let's see. I'm going to go down to the the dissipate negativity part. Um, you don't if, if things are when things are going wrong and you're in a position of responsibility and power, you're kind of you're kind of a bulwark. Uh, so if you've got a team working for you and and management is giving you a lot of hell, try to keep that from going down. That's never never going to make your team work better if if they feel that negativity coming from you, even if it's coming from somebody else. So sort of the, the bad vibes stop here um, is kind of my, and then also try not to, to pass, you know, negativity back up. Like you, you want people to feel like things are possible. Um, even if not everything's possible, that something is possible. Um, and you want your team to feel like you've got their back and that you're gonna take care of them. Um, and the other part of this is situational awareness as a creative director or creative producer, like keeping your head up and listening uh, to what's going on around you. Like, is there some traffic over here that's starting to sound like it's going to come your way? Can you step over there and be like, hi, <laughs> should I be part of this conversation? Um, is, you know, is something changing with the scenic that's going to impact video? Like being, being really aware of the room and what's going on around you. Like your animators can put their headphones on and, and dial in. Um, sometimes I'll have my headphones on, but I'm not playing anything for, through them. Uh, I just want to be aware of what's going on in the room around me. Um, so you can spot problems early, maybe head them off, or at least be in a position of not surprised when they come to you. All right. And kind of my last bit is, what is the core concept of what you're trying to do? Uh, what is what is this beautiful North Star of the show, of the piece? Like, what thing between you and the client are you trying to create that cannot be lost at any costs? So if you understand what's at the core of what you're all trying to create, you can always bring the conversation back in. Like, does this serve this purpose? How can How can we create a solution to this problem that really is respectful of the core of the piece. So in the case of uh, Foo Fighters, when we lost three weeks you know, after the first show, it's like, what is, what is the minimum viable product? What do we create given half of the time um, that still is, um, still really honors that connection between the audience and you know, knowing we don't have a lot of time and knowing that we're going to have to go forward and all these other things and we decided to keep the cameras. And, the, um, and so we, st we focused our work on, on the camera mixing and uh, didn't do as much like full content at that point. And that did impact the rest of the show, but that was the very core of the idea. So when we lost three weeks, stick to that, fo that thing that we focused on and it was great. And, and yeah, understand why and who you're doing it for. Understand your users, your stakeholders, you know, when you're at a concert and you turn around and you see the audience cheer because a moment has landed just perfectly, that's what you're trying to do. And if something that you're doing isn't really aligning with that and your client wants to change or something that the client's doing isn't aligning with that, um, you know, in the end, the client pays for it, they get to say, but you can, you can say, I don't see how this meets with the piece, help me understand it so that I do it right for you. And uh, remember to take care of yourself and your crew. Uh, ordering dinner goes a long way <laughs> if you're if you're going to be stuck in for a day, or you know, just make sure that your people, the people working for you, feel taken care of, and that you're understanding that they're human and and that you appreciate what they're doing. Because um, we all go through, we've all been through hell. We'll all continue to go through hell on the occasional show, but the thing that makes us friends really is those shared shared experiences, shared meals, uh, moments that bring us together. You mentioned eating with the crew. It, it's really important to, to keep that human side and understand that people have emotions and really do care and that you care about them back. And yeah, take care of your ergonomics and your back and get up and walk, all those things. And yeah, thanks very much.
questions? Or are we out of time? Yes. Would you say that that's become easier now that you have this really amazing portfolio to to get to a point of having ethos to talk with these big artists about the block series? What, what was it like before you had a portfolio? How, how are you able to connect with them? I'd say it actually hasn't changed as much as I hoped it would. Um, <laughs> I've it it really just depends on the artist and how much they want to talk with you and you know what relationship they have with people like in in the case of like specifically dealing with artists sometimes i get to meet them in person yeah. annie lennox came to my house and sat on my couch and we talked about art um <laughs> we still have the couch um <laughs> annie lennox sat here uh you know and sometimes you get to you don't during working during the pandemic, we didn't talk to anybody ever because nobody got to talk to anybody. Um, but it, I think what's changed is my ability to act, ask the right questions of the right people um, and sort of understand what my process is a little bit and what I need to get that started. And also, uh, let's see, I'm going to bounce out of this for a second. I did bring some decks. Uh, one moment. Maybe you did. Where I put it? Nope. All right. I'll think about that. But yeah, that, those conversations, it's all very dependent on how much the artist wants to talk to you, how much they want to pay attention to the show, what else they're doing. Are they still recording? Um, I find that it is easier when I do have those conversations. I, I come from a place now of feeling more confident in my own process and my own work than I did at the very beginning. All right. Thank you guys very much.